Let's see. Okay. Okay, good. We are recording now on YouTube. Uh, thanks everyone for joining here this section for another content key. We need to like to postpone last to last Thursday, but we are back today. So and today I'm planning like to talk about the start talking uh, about the bone, the Broglie ideas, about the interpretation of quantum mechanics. And okay, let me start sharing my screen. Okay, so we will talk about Von de Broglie ideas. We start today. I'm planning like to have a series of, of talk about webinars about like Von de Broglie because I mean, it's a, there's a lot of things to, to talk. So uh, I think three or four webinars about this is, is, is a good two or three, maybe, and where we'll discuss like the, the, the main ideas about Bond and Broglie. Uh, today, I'm planning like to, to, to give a general idea, and in the end, I'll show one example, like about the, the double slit experiment, like how, how they like, see or interpret this experiment, okay? So, on the Broglie theory, interpretation. So, starting like a little bit of history, like a summary of the historical part. Like in 27, uh, Louis de Broglie then suggested a quantum theory where the position of a particle that I'm calling here XA and the trajectory of a quantum, quantum particle A should have reality independently of the observation. However, it would be necessary a new mechanic. That's the conclusion that the Broglie uh, had. Like it would be necessary a new mechanic to, to explain the, the trajectories of uh, these trajectories of the, the particles. Something that was not present in the usual Heisenberg ball mechanics. So since the some weird quantum effects can appear in situations where the quantum particles are free of interactions, like for example, in the double slit experiment, the Broglie suggested a change in the Newtonian laws, proposing that every particle, free or not, has a velocity determined by a wave that he call like wave pilot. On an expression like this, like that. So J here is like a, a, a current of probability that we I will show the, the general expression soon. And psi square is the our probability. Yeah? Psi is the wave function, and psi square is the probability density. And the x dt is the velocity of the particle A. So to find the, the, the expression for the wave pilot. The things that we need to do was just to solve the usual Schrodinger equation and does a particle interact with other particles and in the background and you have like the psi and this interaction will be given by the boundary conditions of the problem but okay so this is what's in the 20s later on the Broglie would give up from this theory mainly because he was unable like to to explain the process of quantum measure and the things why it was became like a uh, stop. Uh, he stopped like the, the these ideas here. Uh, and just to to notice, like in twenty seven, this 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 these ideas was discussing in a conference. That's the famous survey conference. I don't know that the how to spell, but I think it's survey is a, a city in the Switzerland. And where the main people from from uh, the, the fathers of the quantum theory, like 
Einstein, De Broglie, Don, Niels Bohr, and many others, Pauli, and many others, was present and have these discussions about the, the, the best way to interpret like, quantum, quantum mechanics. Okay, but uh, uh, that was some problems, some pro uh, about the interpretations of the, the, the results that the Broglie found, and he like uh, at least uh, he give up uh, for a moment about the theory. But this was like in the fifties, Bohm, David the Bohm, in fifty two, returned with the Broglie ideas in this paper here, uh, nineteen fifty two published in this uh, journal, Physical Review, uh, with this title, like a suggested interpretation of quantum theory in terms of hidden variables, for here part one. And uh, uh, here I just highlight some parts of the, the abstract. So the usual interpretation of the quantum theory is self-consistent. Self but it involves an assumption that cannot be tested experimentally. That the most complete possible specification of an individual system is in terms of a wave function that determines only probable results of the actual measurement process. And then he suggests here a theory of hidden variables, which in principle determine the, the precise behavior of an individual system but which are in practice, in practice, in practice average over measurements of the types that can be now carried out, now by this time. Eh? So in this paper, and in a subsequent paper that we will not discuss today, an inter interpretation of the quantum theory in terms of the these just uh, hidden variables is suggested. And then this, this suggested interpretation provides a broader conceptual framework than the usual interpretation, because it makes a possible a precise and continuous de description of all processes, even at the quantum level. This broader conceptual framework allow, allows more general mathematical formulations of the theory than those allowed by the usual interpretation. And we we'll see today this. And in the end, as I told in the, the in the beginning of the talk, I will show one example from another paper uh, where we could like calculate explicitly the the, the trajectories of a particles like in a double slit experiment. So this is the end comment. Uh, in any case, that mere possibility of such interpretation proves that is not necessary for us to give up a precise rational and objective description of individual systems at quantum level of accuracy. Okay, so let's discuss a little bit this paper here about David Bohm. I'll try like to summary the uh, some main results, but we can like uh, return in, in uh, about other things in, in, in today or or in the next in the next webinars. So following Bohm. Initially, uh, to simplify the things, we will not take into account the spin, but he considered the spin in the, in, I think the, the, the second, in another paper, I don't remember if this one, but I've not considered the spin of the particles here uh, in the today discussion. And this will be considered in the future. So let's start with the Schrodinger equation for any particles. We can write this in the usual way, like this way. This uh, uh, nabla square of A is the Laplacian operator rel relative to the particle A. V is the classical particle interaction potential, and Psi is a complex function that can be expressed in this way, where R and S are real, um, real, real things, no? real parameters. So it's convenient to write uh, P is the my probability of density probability in, the, in terms of R square. It's just the, the psi square, right? You take the modulus of psi square uh, because uh, 
are are real so we could write the probability uh, like equal to r squared and we could do, we are able like uh, using this in this equation we are able to find these two equations here satisfies the initial equation this for a system with n particles so let's uh, uh try to interpret these two equations here now so in the first equation like this one here we have this term here that's added to the classical potential we note the addition of a, we call it it's a extra potential that i'll call here u of q that's given by this expression or in terms of r could be written in this way okay in terms of p and in terms of r so this term here is called like a quantum potential quantum mechanical potential so it's present here is this term Uh, this other term can be associated with a velocity, this gradient of S in this equation here, and a velocity vector of any particle passing from X. And J, that's given by this expression here, it's a mean current of particles in this example. So J here is a type of current of, current of par particles, that's this term here. And this would be like a conservation equation for probabilities. Okay, that's given by this. So this equation here, if you take into account these two terms here, uh, this is just the a probability equation. Uh, a conserv conservative equation, so for the for the probability. And we could define the moment, the momentum P, small p of A, the vector P, mass times the, oh, sorry, it's a typo here, dt, I forget the dt, dx here, okay? dx dt, it's the gradient of S. Since the velocity, that's dx dt, is given by this expression here, multiply this by M, we have the, momentum that's the gradient of s and the equation of motion of a particle a acted by a classical potential v and the quantum mechanical potential is given by this so this is a a, a, a modification in the uh, newton's law okay it's the mass times acceleration and we have this potential here is classical potential and this is the extra uh, quantum potential. Where in this case here, in general, it's very small, this term, because it's proportional to h bar, e square, and the mass in the in the daily uh, particles, in general, are very big. So this, in general, is very small, this term. And we could, like, recover, like, the Newton's laws uh, when, when this is not present, right? when this is negligible. So, okay, one can see from these equations that the trajectory of a particle A will be different from the classical trajectory if UQ is different of zero. And the classical limit on von de Broglie theory is obtained when UQ is negligible. Okay, so summarizing the ideas above, we can say that from the equation three, equation three is the equation of conservation. Okay, I'll see it a lot of times. The equation of conservation of the, the density probability. So, from equation three, for a set of system of any particles whose probability densities of these particles being as opposite uh, to being found as in the Copenhagen interpretation. So, when the particles are in positions x1, x2, x3, xn, at a given time t, we have the probability. So different here, like we, we know uh, the positions of the, 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 the particles. Uh, the particle one is in position x1, the particle two in position x2, 
and we have uh, the probabilities that we can like evaluate in a posterior time. So in other words, if we do not know the initial positions of the n particles that constitute each member of a set of systems of n quantum particles, but if the initial positions in the set are given by like pi p initial in a time t equal to zero, then in a posterior time, in a generic instant of time t, equation three, that's the equation for the, the, the conservation of probability, guarantees that the distribution of the positions implies the ball rule, that p is equal to psi squared. And all statistical results of the theory will be the same as those obtained in the Copenhagen interpretation. Thus, the wave function has a double role in the theory. The first is dynamic, as it guides the particle through the relationship J of B, J over P. And the second is the statistic, statistical by providing the distribution of initial position for a statistical set of systems. So this duplicity of attribution does not occur in the Copenhagen interpretation, where the wave function does not play a dynamic role. So this term here, it's like the, the new term. This comes from here, right? This term here, right? Is the new. So the trajectories obtained from equation three are called Bohmian trajectories. And we highlight here that the particle cannot go through the points where psi square or r square is equal to zero since the probability of the particle being in that place is new and from the newton's law we'll get an m here but not a type from this equation the newton's law then the modification of the newton's law this equation here i just put put uq here uh, for a given classical potential V, it could exist several quantum potential, UQ, depending on the type of solution of the equation one, that's the Schrodinger equation. So depends on the solution of the Schrodinger equation, uh, we could have, uh, that depends on V, we could ha have like different several quantum potential, UQ. Would be used to evaluate like the momentum operator P. And with this, we could like determine the trajectory, the trajectory of the particles. So this is a consequence of the superposition principle and the solution of the Schrodinger equation that depends on the boundary conditions of the system, like the, like walls, the slits, etc. Thus, the phase of the wave function and the quantum potential could be complicated since they depend on the parameters associated with the experiment. It is from these parameters that one could not note the influence from the experiments in the quantum system, as postulated by Bohr, but in the Bohm de Broglie, as you could for short here, B, 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 Bohm de Broglie, this is an explicit influence that could be testable. Okay, because it appears in the like in the boundary conditions in the Schrodinger equation directly. Okay, so to, to see this, this is just a summary, brief summary from the, the, the paper. And like to, to, to give a better idea, let's see one example, like the double slit experiment. So the phase of a superposition of wave functions can be quite complicated if, if the phase of its compounds are simple. In the case of a double slit, the global phase depends on parameters related to, to the experiment, such as the width and the separation between the slits. Okay. So in this way, these parameters, which are not linked to any fundamental interaction, can influence through the phase of the wave function, the movement of the particle, even in regions where there is no mechanical contact between it and end of these slits. We will now discuss one example considered in reference three that I'll show in a moment, 
where the trajectories and the quantum potential are shown in figures. I, uh, I just noticed uh, a little bit uh, before we start, I forget to put the, uh, the other figures, but I have the paper here and I show you guys. So we will now discuss one example considering reference tree, where the trajectories and the quantum potential are shown in figures one and two respectively. So this is the paper. So the initial wave function was a superposition in this paper. They consider that the, the wave function is a superposition of two Gaussian function, each one centered in each slit. So they try like, to model the, the slits with two Gaussian function. And these authors here, they use this function to evaluate the Schrodinger equation and the solution found was used in the equation for the probability equation that I'm calling here equation two. The, the conservation, the, the, the equation for the conservation of probability. Thus, they could found the Bohmian trajectories whose initial positions were present in the two slits. Like they give like some numerical values and found. So this is basically what here, just in the summary, we, they say that they he examined the notion of quantum potential introduced by the Bohm de Broglie and calculate its explicit, ex, explicit form in the case of two slits interference experiment. They also calculate the example of particle trajectories for the two slits. The result shows clearly how the quantum potential produces the bone chain of trajectories that is required to obtain the usual fringe intensity pattern. Okay, so this is the, the trajectories from the particles that they calculated, like uh, theoretically. These are the two slits, and these are the possible trajectories. The places where we have nothing here in this region, the place where the probability to find the particles are known at zero. Okay. So, from a physical point of view, the particles enter through one of these leads, and that's the uh, important, but the wave function passes through both and informs the particles about the other slit through the equation for probability, equation three. The information that is continuously passing to the particle contains that data on the size and the separation of these leads. The possible existence of detectors and everything that's relevant to its movement. And note the jumps made by the particles in the region where they are free. It can be seen that its distribution in the detector describes the interference figure. I will, I will show the, the interference figure in a moment. And as the wave function is new at the center line, we can say with certainty, contrary to the, the usual interpretation, that the particles detected in the upper part came from the upper slit and analog, analogously to the lower one. So the particles detected here for sure came from these slits, and the particles detected here for sure came from, from the below slit. Since they cannot cross the central line. Okay, so this is the broad idea, this is the references that I used today, and the, the figure for the interference, it's here in the paper, I'll show you now, it's this. Okay, that's the quantum potential for two Gaussian slits viewed from screen S2. So we can here see the, the crest and, and throws due to the interference of the the quantum potential. Hmm? So, okay, so this is just a brief summary about the these ideas. And we are here and what will you guys think about this? Comments, criticisms, So the idea is, at least as I understood so far, 
the important point is this one, most important point. Uh, this one informs the particle a lot. Yeah, from phys physical point of view, the particle enters through one of these leads, but the wave function, so we have the particle and we have the wave function. The particle goes from the up or down slit, but we have the wave function that gives the passive through both, slit, both slits and informs the particle about the, the other slits. And you can see this in equation three, that the equation for probability. Okay, comments? Carlos, I got a comment or a question. Got... Um, could you bring that slide back up, the last screen you just had? Yes. Okay, that last, that last bullet point. Um, the wave function is null at the center line. We can say with certainty, contrary to the usual interpretation, that the particles detected in the upper part came from the upper slit and the lower part. All right, so this represents a difference between the bottom interpretation and the board interpretation. Mm -hmm. uh, this difference should be testable. Has anybody tested it? And which interpretation panned out in this case? Yeah, I, I don't know. I think the as the wave function is new at the center line, we can say with certainty, contra the usual mm -hmm. the particles detect in the upper part. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. As far as I, I know, they never like tested this directly, I think. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know exactly. Yeah, this they yeah. Yeah, but as far as I know, this was not testable. It was not tested. Not tested, right? Yeah, tested was not tested. Right. Um but you just said something interesting. No, I <laughs> maybe because like the difficulty to see exactly this this I mean it seems like you could put a sensor right where the the probability is zero to see if it is zero or not. Yeah, but how this would be different from the wouldn't the additional sensor be passed on to to the system by the extra term in the de Broglie equation? Mm. It, it would be a different configuration with the extra sensor, if I'm understanding. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I guess there's two questions here. You said it's never been tested. The question will, is it testable? I mean, yeah, because in this case, what, what, what's the difference? We could make this, this test, but how? Because as far as I know, if you make like, if you consider like the Copenhagen interpretation, you have, they say like you have a wave that pass, right? And we'll, we'll see the, the, the interference pattern. And you, you see here the same thing, like the, I don't know if they could like follow the trajectory like in this okay. thing here to say that the trajectory is exactly like this. I think okay. in the end, what they have, they have this, like a pattern that's exactly the same. But I think mm -hmm. the difficulty is like to say, oh, the particle like follow this projector here. It's like, okay, here is the detector. Here's the leads. And let's say that they follow this trajectory here in particular. I think the problem yeah. is. I'm thinking like you, you know, since this, these are these particles are they are they photons or electrons? In this experiment, oh, in this suggestion, I don't remember well what they consider here. So I'm thinking, could you do something like the, like the Storm Garrock, where you have like a sheet of material that would detect the photons, and then you'd be able to see distribution? Yeah, but what, what I don't understand, how, how this could be like different, because I, I understand they detect here, 
and you have like the interference pattern, like in the Copenhagen right. interpretation. So how you could like well, the difference would be with the center, you'd have that hole. You have nothing. Yeah, with the probability of zero, you'd never find a photon there. Yeah, but it's the same in the Copenhagen, right? Because this is the Cop the Copenhagen interpretation will have exactly like the the wave pattern. Someplace. Okay, is this a chart of the Copenhagen result, the bond result? This one right here. Uh, this is bond. This is bond. bond. Okay. This is, is this paper. Is the paper that I seated. It's here. Hmm. That's the figure. And here is just like a like a total the, the slits. Mm -hmm. And they use like a Gaussian function to model uh, the, the, the image is not so good because I think the, the, the paper is scanned. So but this is, they use like these expressions here to, okay. to model like the 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 slits and they evaluate like the psi. And the psi put in the Schrodinger equation, and the Schrodinger equation they put in the the result they use like this equation. This is the gradient of s mass times velocity. Okay, it's not cannot see here. That's okay. the momentum equation, and they could like evaluate the trajectories numerically, of course. Yeah, I guess if it was easy, but to I, think, I think if I understood. Maybe I'm not sure if I understood in the end what we say, we have this. This you could measure, like a, a, a wave pattern, right? Uh, this, the, okay. this, the, I think like that. The trajectories, uh, I think this, because the, the, this is the, I show, but in the paper is not so good. It puts in the, let's see here. So the trajectories, I don't know how you could like follow the particle to give. Oh, the particle mm -hmm. has this trajectory here. Okay. It when we have the the, the crest and throws, and to make the difference for Copenhagen, I don't. At least I didn't know this. I don't know if like Diego, you have some. Thank you, Carlos. Okay. Okay. But I mean, I'm not, as I told you in the beginning, I'm not a specialist, maybe I'm wrong. At least it was this, what I understood, the difficulty to, to have the difference between one and the other. The, the, the Copenhagen in the here. Yeah, I don't know enough about this to really comment much on it, but um, in terms of, predictions i think the difficulty is that um pilot wave theory predicts the exact same results as conventional standard quantum mechanics so when you perform measurements you're going to see the exact same results now when it comes to those trajectories again i, I don't know enough to to tell if what is shown in that diagram is what the actual trajectories of the particles will actually look like but even if they are you couldn't measure them because once you interact with the particle it probably decoheres so that trajectory is no longer preserved because you're um entangling the system with the particle itself so i believe i again i don't know but i believe that those trajectories that are shown in the diagram is for uh, a particle that is traveling um, without being disrupted by anything else. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I don't think they're directly measurable either. <clears throat> now, the trouble I have with this is that if I understand this correctly, the idea behind pilot wave theory is that you have an underlying wave guiding the particle, right? So um, the particle is uh, always has a, a determined position and momentum, right? And 
um, if that is the case, then that means that the particle, I, I would presume that this means that the particle has a definite size, but then that means you can talk about the size of an electron and what does that even mean? I don't know if that's, um, like how do you quantify that? Um, like, is, in, is this theory telling us that, let's say electrons are little spheres traveling around guided by a wave? Um, because if that's the case, then those little spheres probably have a, then a definite measurable radius. And as far as I know, that's just not coherent with standard quantum mechanics. But perhaps there's something I don't understand well enough about this. If I understand it, these particle does have all these definite quantities, but we don't know them until we measure it. <clears throat> so, yeah. so that in that sense, there is no distinction. It's just the one interpreter says that they don't have any of these uh, <clears throat> qualities until you measure. And the, if I'm understanding correctly, the de broglie Brom interpreter is saying it does have these qualities, but we don't know them. So. I still think it's just a matter of interpretation. But wouldn't this mean that in this interpretation, uh, let's say electrons have definite sizes, so it, it will be a measurable quantity? Y yes, but it would be, I, I'm assuming it would be a different experimental setup to measure, say, the diameter. And mm -hmm. so that the experimental setup to do that would affect the outcome and affect what you see. So I, I think it's kind of moot whether really existing things that you haven't measured have more reality than Copenhagen, which is saying there is nothing until you measure. Well, the, the the trouble I have is that in let's say standard quantum mechanics, um, an electron is the wave function, right? So if you're going to measure the size of the electron, well, if you measure it with let's say some wavelength, what's going to happen is that you're going to localize the wave function to the the width of that wavelength, and as you keep changing the wavelength, you will change the 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 precision of that wave probability wave function, right? Which means that electrons really don't have a definite size. It depends on the experiment itself. But in this pilot wave theory, it sounds like the wave function is just a, a, a guiding wave. The electrons are corpuscular elements moving guided by this wave so this yeah. corpuscular elements in essence we should be able to measure them right and measure their size but i don't believe there's any evidence of that now again maybe i'm misinterpreting what the theory says about this but um that well, seems to be a, a question for me uh how do you interpret that my my impression is that that it is so self-contained that it makes no different predictions. So if, I, if I'm understanding it correctly, the pilot wave would know that you are looking to detect the uh, size of the electron, and so that would pilot it in that way. It, it, it's like exactly an unobservable hidden thing. By, by definition in this system. So, so I don't see by definition how you can observe something which is defined to be unobservable. But my understanding is that the hidden variable here is a wave function. The yeah. particles are supposed to be physical real things that you could potentially measure, right? So um, 
you should be able to measure its properties, like its mass, its charge, and also its size. But, but how are any of those things different than measuring its position? Well, yeah, I'm not, I'm not discussing position right now. I'm discussing just the size of an electron, right? Position. I, I, I'm just suggesting that if I'm understanding this interpretation, that if you set up an equation regarding size rather than position, it would have the same quality that until you do the measurement, you don't know what that position, what that size is. That the, the born rule still applies. Yeah, I, I guess my criticism would be that there is no experiment which can conceivably tell whether there's a pilot wave or not, because it predicts the same thing. I think we would have to work out what you're suggesting to d set up some equation and experiment to measure the size of the electron, but that would only give you a result at the end of that experiment. It's really, it seems to me, totally a philosophical thing whether there is really a size, position, any number of things. And, it, and that the only difference is that the Bohm interpretation is saying, yes, there really are really in some ineffable philosophical sense these quantities. And the, uh, again, if I'm understanding it, the Bohr interpretation is saying, there aren't, but I don't see how you can tell one way or the other because any experiment is only going to give you the result of that experiment. And yeah. in both, both interpretations, the experimental setup is what's determining what you may get. Yeah. Um, so I agree that uh, I agree with that for the. You know, standard quantum mechanics interpretation. Um, but the way I understood pilot wave theory was slightly different. Oh. What what is what you describe, what is hidden and non measurable is the pilot wave, but the the particles themselves should be measurable. Um, but um Otherwise, as you say, there's no distinction between the two. Um, I think that there's an assumption that's being made here, which we may not be able to make. And that assumption is, when you talk about the size of electrons, Diego, that electron has a set size. Yeah. I think the question how to to measure the size, right? Yeah, and you're, you're assuming it even has a set size, that it's not oscillating in some way. Maybe that's the origin of the wave behavior. Um, mm. You know, it could be, as it has a spin, whatever that property is, maybe there's some kind of size oscillation going on. And the other issue is, what do you determine a size is? Like, if you tried to measure the size, let's say, the planet Jupiter, yeah. Well, well, the atmosphere is thick. You go further and further down. When do you say I'm actually in the planet? Yeah, but you then know? that's that's an issue with the theory, right? Because then it's not complete. If you're telling me that you can explain everything except this one thing, then um, pilot wave theory would need additional rules to now explain what are particles. Right, because in the standard quantum mechanics, you say the particles are the wave function. That's all you need to know. The wave function is it. That's all. In this theory, you have the the guiding wave and the particles. But now, if we don't know what the particles are, then the theory is not complete. Ah, mm. the what what I'm not understanding, Diego, is what is different about the size of the electron versus its position or velocity or any number of other potential observables. I don't understand why the size of the electron should be special compared to anything else. Uh, 
because I think that is the statement of pile of weight theory. So standard quantum mechanics says an electron is the wave function, and all you can know is all you can say about it is probabilities about where the electron is, how big the electron is, how fast the electron is moving, right? That's standard quantum mechanics. Yeah. In pile of wave theory, we're saying these electrons are actually real things with defined positions, defined momentums, defined velocities, defined uh, sizes. And the, pi the pilot wave is guiding them, right? But so that's, that's how the theory is um, proposed. So if you're proposing it that way, we need to have a way to explain what the size of the electron is as well, right? Um, as opposed to the mass. Uh, well, yeah, as opposed to position and momentum, because because the what, the equations that Carlos showed will give us information about position and momentum, and it's a you know well stated theory. But what about the size of these things, right? I, I guess what I'm thinking of is going back to like high school science, and you know we all learned that uh, you know. Protons and neutrons are huge compared to electrons. Mm -hmm. You know, they carry the same charge. And the main reason for that has always been, well, they have so much more mass. Um, yeah. In fact, the electron mass is negligible, so it's got to be really small. You know, so this issue of what is, what is the nature of an electron isn't a quantum mechanics issue. It's an issue that goes right back to basic physics. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, is it a hard uh, as I said, or is it this my, little my only, my only concern is, my only concern would be that, and again, maybe there is a way to show it, but from what I saw in the equations, it's not very clear to me how you would explain what these particles are. That's all. Um, and I mean, yeah, you can say, you can say, yeah. okay, th this is, might be a separate issue, but then that means the theory might not be complete. I, I think that's a good criticism in, in that the, the Broglie is, is saying that there's a reality, but it's not saying that we know it until we make a measurement. So I don't see that it's saying anything different. Mm -hmm. and, and if I understand the equation, the pilot wave function is encoding the entire system, including the experimental setup. Mm -hmm. So that in this experiment, there's, there's nothing about the size of the electron. But if you set up an experiment to measure the size of the electron, wouldn't that be part of your equation then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm... I, I wonder that too. I I just I'm not familiar enough with it, um, but perhaps yeah, I'm I'm sure that people have looked into this, and there might be an explanation. But I wonder what I wonder what the answer is, right? If you ask, if you ask, explain to me what the size of an electron is in, in using uh, pilot wave theory. What the answer to that question is? <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I, I just think the particular example that was given was for the classical photon double slit, and we don't talk about the size of the photon. Again, it seems to me that if one understood the experiment to measure the size, one would that would be a slightly different expression of the wave equation and then again with this additional very small de broglie term to, <laughs> I, I i guess i fail to see how it makes any predictions that would differ because it explicitly says that it will give the same mm -hmm. own rule yes but, correct so the predictions are exactly identical yeah, there's no difference between the two. So it's, that's why it's called 
an interpretation because really it's more of um, a statement of how the underlying principles work, but the results that it predicts are the same. Yeah. Um, but my concern is that any interpretation sh should be complete, right? Um, there shouldn't be any gaps or things you can't explain. Now, obviously, that's why there's different interpretations because they're, they're, each one of them has something that is unsatisfying, right? Yeah. Um, the issue I'm raising, I don't, I don't know if it's a common problem that is uh, brought up when it comes to pilot wave theory. I'm curious about it. There might be a, an answer. The one I know is an issue, a real problem, is that it it does not work well um when you're trying to do quantum field theory uh -huh. so extending extending uh pilot wave theory to quantum field theory so not just standard quantum mechanics but quantum field theory be becomes problematic and my understanding is that there are ways to do it but you have to give away the determinism part of the theory which is the whole point of proposing it in the first place so yeah, there are mathematical tricks that you can do to marry um, pilot wave theory with quantum field theory and, you know, with with um, special relativity, but you have to be you know, with the terminus, which seems like, you know, uh, then wh why even propose it in the first place? Yeah, that's, I, I, I hope to learn more about that as I go on. Uh, but from uh, my point of view, it's just adding another term to the equation that is so small that it's unmeasurable. So, in, as Newton would say, you know, if, if this is an unneeded, how does he put it, do not multiply <laughs> entities without sufficient reason. So that, that that would be my objection to the the Broglie Bohm would be that why do you need this extra term if it doesn't tell you anything different? In terms of the experience, right? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, maybe. Uh, uh, remember that we we didn't talk today about the initial problem. I mean, I just mentioned that the Broglie had the problem in the beginning, and it seems I didn't read yet, I didn't study yet, but it seems that a bomb like fixed the, the problems that the Broglie had, okay. and maybe this could like this could like uh, light we, uh, especially for the, the things that Diego was talking about the the size of the electron, because the thing is how how you measure this. The, the size. So uh, maybe in the next talk, I will try to bring something. What what was done like about the mission problem, the usual interpretation and using this. And maybe we can like this could like uh, makes the thing more more clear. What 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 is really happening? But it's it's good. I mean, it's nice 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 questions that. Diego said, told that bring us about this, this, this topic with the size of the things, how you determine how you. Okay, my, my understanding of electromagnetism is only classical, and I believe there electrons are considered to be point particles, which has its own problems. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah, I just did a quick web search on this diameter of an electron. And it seems like there's two competing viewpoints, which probably both have their own pragmatic reasons. One is what you're talking about, George, which is electron is a point charge um, surrounded by a halo of electrical charge. The other is electron actually has a diameter of 10 to the minus 14 meters. Um, and I see sources quoting both descriptions. 
So I don't know. Um, it might depend on what theory you're coming from, whether you're looking at classical or quantum. Uh, but, you know, there have been work on the size of an electron, but then also there's work on the structure of the electron, which indicates the structure might not be as solid, a small solid particle like uh, we're, we're thinking of. Yeah. It's a point surrounded yeah. by a halo of charge, and apparently there are scientific articles published that say the halo of charge is really spherical. So it's not like a squishy thing that changes. Um, interesting to do a web search on that, just the guys and see what you see. It seems like there are very few points out there. That, that's that's interesting because again, I don't know the physics involved, but I believe that the electron also has a wave nature. In which case, if you're looking at it as a wave, it would only have meaning to talk about its uh, uh, frequency and phase and amplitude, mm -hmm. not diameter. What would diameter mean? That would be like asking what's the diameter of a photon. Mm -hmm. um Real quick question aside, kind of related this, Carlos. In the experiment you just described with double slits, how was the separation of slits determined? In this, in this. The size of the slit itself. I mean, Stern Gerlach, they use the wavelength of a photon and whatnot. Yeah, in this paper. Let's see here. I think they used like in the sun. They use some numerical values here. Let's see if I found maybe here. Mm -hmm. Let me go. Uh, here. Uh, the experiments performed, uh, we have carried out numerical computations using data based on the experiments performed by Johnson. The energy of the electrons, we have used the velocity, the separation between the two slits A and B is this 10 to the minus four centimeters. Mm. And the half width is assumed to be 10 to the minus five. Mm. The quantum potential was calculated in the region between the slits. Yeah, the X, Y, I think, Y is the, is the, the separation. Let's see. Why is this? Okay. Why X? So this is this size, right? It's between ten or minus one dot nine minus two times ten to the minus four centimeters to two to in between minus two and 10 to the minus four centimeters and two. It's the separation. Okay. And the, the slits from the the screen, the bounding screen is 35 centimeters. Slits. That is the tactile, right? Mm. So here again. So this is like 35 centimeters. And the separation is 10 to the minus four, I think, about 10 to the minus four. Two times 10 to the minus four. Okay. But this is theoretical, okay? Theoretical calculation. I guess my question would be, has anybody designed or performed an experiment to see whether this additional very small de Broglie term can be detected? Uh, 
You mean like the trajectories? The additional quadratic term in H. Okay, the potential, like the quantum potential. Because if that could be detected rather than saying, well, it's too small to be detected, that would be a actual different prediction. It just seems to me from what Diego was saying that one would have to do for this idea that you can measure the diameter of that, you'd have to have a different experimental setup and a different expression of the equations with a term for this diameter. And then when you do the experiment, it would lo and behold at the end tell you in this experimental setup under these conditions, you have a probability of seeing this diameter. Yeah, and maybe, maybe this is is related to the, like the measure problem. We will talk next. In the next next webinar. I'd be interested in, in if Einstein had anything to say about this De Broglie Bohm interpretation, in that he was a realist as opposed to Bohr and Heisenberg being anti-realists. Yeah, when De Broglie suggested was 27, like in the in this conference, yeah. and, and Einstein was present, and I think he, he agreed like with De Broglie. But okay. then it, it, seemed, it seemed it had some problems, some explanations that De Broglie was not able to, to explain. And then the theory returned in the 50s with bone but i uh, don't know if so there's quite a gap between 1927 and 1952 yeah, yeah it's like 25 years well anyway thank you carlos and if you can put those slides out i would like to look at the three references okay i'll i'll, I'll put in fact i think we still don't don't have uh, in GitHub the, a place to put like the quantum T. I'll, I'll, I'll ask nobody to okay to create some something to put these slides. And I think Bumble they also just me finish the 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 talk. Uh, the quantum house of cards seminar. Here is the Bumble yes. Day. Oh, okay, Bumble Day over here. You can yes, say. Uh... Yeah, I was uh, just waiting for uh, your uh, interesting debate conversation until it uh, um, finished, so I could uh, just let you know. Um, the thing, unfortunately, has been postponed for next week. This is partly because of my availability as well, so we couldn't do it uh, last week nor this week. So, But next week it's on, next Thursday, on the 29th at 6, around this time. Okay. So, yeah. It will be good. We'll have uh, a break. Um, we won't have quantum T next week, obviously, <laughs> because we have one now. Uh, but yeah, I invite you all to to join in. You know, we are all supporters of uh, quantum computing, uh, but it will be a very interesting uh, debate by um, talk by Javier, followed by you know um, open discussion. You know, for people to express their views about the state of play in the in the thing in, the, in this industry, in this emerging industry. That's it. Oh, thank you, Bambode. Okay, I so have, good. I have to run to myself. Yeah, thanks, Carlos. Thanks for that, Bambode. Okay. Okay. See you. See you, Bob. Okay. Thanks, Claudia. Yeah. See you, Claudia. Yeah. I'm out of here. yeah, I think everyone is leaving, so maybe we could uh, stop recording, I guess. Yeah. So, bye, people from. <laughs> You too. You too. See yeah. You. <laughs> See you guys in the next one. Yeah. Yeah.